Presbyterian shout tonight. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I appreciate that. That was good for sure. All right, take your Bible. Thank you guys for that. Take your Bible to Psalm 138. 138. 138 tonight. And I want to read one verse, and we're going to just kind of start here, and then we'll jump to our text in a moment. But we'll use this verse as our introduction, if you will. Psalm 138, a Psalm of David, and verse 7. He said, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt provide me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. So I want to call your attention to that first expression or a phrase there in that verse. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Amen. You know, this year, 2020, has been for most, if not all of us, a time when we walk in the midst of trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you really think about this year, life as we have known it has been absolutely turned upside down exactly. yeah. right. this year. Who could ever imagine that in our country, Schools would be closed for months on end. Yeah. Churches would be locked down and fined in certain places if they opened. Right. Imagine that. What in the world happened to the Constitution? Oh, yeah. Amen. Free exercise yeah. of our religion. That's right. It's tragic what's happened. In order to go to a store, and I said this to the pastor today, you got to put on a mask. That's right. Can you imagine if you went into a bank before COVID with a mask, and they, they'd be pushing the button and you'd be arrested. Now you can't even make a $10 deposit without a mask. It's amazing to me. In this nation of plenty, plenty there would be food shortages, travel restrictions, mandatory quarantines, I wondered when I even came here, preacher, what, were they going to meet me at the border? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Florida, literally. If you were coming from New York back in March or April to Florida, literally on I-95 coming into the state of Florida, if you had a New York plate, they pulled you over oh right then and told you either quarantine for 14 days, sign a paper, tell us where you're going to be, we're going to check on you, or turn around and go home. And when you came from Louisiana, from the west on Interstate 10, when you hit the Florida border, that's exactly what they did there. Quarantine. And then, of course, multitudes. I mean, we can't even, we can't even know how many people are unemployed and, and, and have struggled through this year. And then, of course, worse than all, millions of our citizens have been infected with what Trump, President Trump called the China virus. <laughs> and... Tens of thousands have died. It's just been a, a walk through trouble without question. Not to mention all the fires out west. I was out preaching on the west coast, and I'm telling you, from the front door to the parking lot on, on the street, I couldn't, even, I couldn't even see in the morning going to church. The, the smoke was so bad. From those wildfires that were burning in Canada and Oregon and Washington and California, I, I thought, I, you know, God help me, I'm happy to be there to preach, but I can't wait to get out of here. I can barely breathe. We've had more hurricanes in the South this year than any year on record. Ravished the state of Louisiana. A walk in the midst of trouble, for sure. And you begin to think about all that. But yet in the midst of all of that, we have a promise in this verse. We can't deny the trouble. There's no way for us to know personally what all of us have experienced mm -hmm. and gone through and people we love and people we know. But in the midst of that, here's the promise. Thou wilt revive me. Mm -hmm. What a great promise. Amen. That's a word from the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> That's a word from God. Though we face afflictions, distress, and trouble, God said, I'll revive you. Amen. I'll revive you. 
You know, the great Charles Spurgeon on this passage said this. He said, if we receive reviving, we need not regret affliction. That's right. When God revives us, trouble will never harm us. Right. Yeah, amen. Amen. You gotta look down the road uh -huh. yeah. past the trouble. Exactly. Years ago, Dr. Lee Robertson, the famous pastor in Chattanooga, Tennessee, announced on a Sunday morning that he was going to preach a message, a simple message on how to be a great Christian. How to be a great Christian. And that massive auditorium was filled that Sunday night to capacity to hear this man of God preach on how to have, uh, how to be a great Christian. And the title of his message was two words, have trouble. <laughs> have trouble. Because <laughs> it's either going to make us or it's going to break us. Yeah. Amen. Have trouble. I've learned in these 45 years of ministry, I've learned through trouble, we can be revived. God can do something when we're in the midst of affliction and trouble that I don't know we let him do any other time. He wants to do it. He wants to draw us closer to him. He wants us to be revived. He wants us to be fulfilled with the Spirit, but I don't know until we really get down if we're welcoming Him to do that in our lives. I think some 48 years ago, I was a student at New Western Baptist College. The pastor ultimately went to that school as well. And I remember hearing Dr. Malone, the president of the school, make a statement, and he was quoting a man that had great influence in his life, a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. Mm -hmm. And the statement was this, it is doubtful that God will use a Christian greatly mm -hmm. until he hurts him deeply. That's right. Now ponder that. Mm -hmm. It is doubtful that God will use a Christian greatly until he hurts them deeply. Right. I could never have imagined <laughs> in my life or even begin to grasp what that would mean in my life and of course there's no way i would ever begin to even think about a year like we have experienced in our country but the reality is this all of us have experienced painful afflictions from time to time all of us go through trouble whether physical emotional financial or spiritual it's part of life psalm 34 19 many are the afflictions of the righteous don't forget the last part of that verse, but the Lord delivered them out of them all. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we forget that last part. Yeah. We moan about the afflictions. We, we struggle with the trouble. But God, as in this verse, in Psalm 34, 19, is promising to do something if we let him. You know, when those storms arise and that trouble comes, we, we typically ask the question, Lord, why is this happening? We probably ask that question this year as we've gone through all this turmoil. And then sometimes we even go a step beyond saying, why is this happening? We say, Lord, why is this happening to me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We personalize it. Yeah. Because we, we look at our life and we say, well, Lord, after all, we're trying to do what you want us to do. We're in church every time the doors are open, or should be, by the way. Um, we serve, we give, we pray, we sacrifice. Why is this happening? To me, why? Why am I going through this? Here's an inconvenient truth. Bad things happen to good people. Now, it's hard to process that. Yeah, by the way, one of the big mistakes we make when we lead someone to the Lord or when we're endeavoring to lead them to the Lord is to make a statement like, if you'll just get saved, all your trouble will be over. Are you kidding me? I never started till I got saved. But we, we make that false promise. And boy, there, you know, who wouldn't buy that? Who wouldn't who wouldn't grab a hold of that? And then they they you know bow their head and they say a prayer, and then guess what? They go to work and get fired the next day. And they're trying to figure out is it is this the God I just gave my life to? Is it that's a that's a mistake to even begin to suggest that. The good news is he's with us through it, Amen. if we'll let him. Amen. 
if we'll lean on him. The word of God is replete with, with examples of this truth that, that bad things happen to good people. I mean, you can journey through the scripture. Think about Joseph. You know, Joseph is an Old Testament picture of Jesus Christ in many ways. But when you look at his life, you say, wow, even in spite of, of you know, the good character and the good nature of that man, look what happened in his life. Betrayed by his brother, sold as a slave, and cast into prison. How's that working for you? <laughs> what about Job? I mean, the Bible says he was upright. Mm -hmm. He was the greatest man of these. He feared God and hated evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how, the, that's how the book of Job opens. Mm -hmm. Introducing us to this person who is stellar, who is, who is beyond reproach. So what does he get for that? Well, he loses his wealth. He loses his health. His wife's not happy with him, for sure. She said, curse God and die. And then, the worst of all, he loses ten children. I mean, that's unimaginable pain. That's trouble that's beyond our ability to even comprehend. That's what he went through. David, betrayed by his own son. John the Baptist, beheaded. Peter, imprisoned. Paul beaten, stoned, robbed. What a testimony he had. Challenges, someone said, is what makes life interesting, but overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. Right, sir. And when God enables us to rise above the trouble, and he works in our heart in a way that I think in most cases he isn't invited to do until we have the trouble, Every Christian has their story of hurt, of pain, of trouble. All of us do. I mean, we could start over here, go row by row. I'm convinced we could stand and, 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 and tell a tale of things that have wounded us and hurt us. But someone said this, you cannot doubt God in the dark what he has revealed in the light. And when we get into the dark, when this gloomy darkness uh, of, of situations and circumstances invade us, it's easy to stand back and question God. It's easy to get angry with God, to be upset with God. Why are you doing this? We say to God. But I want us to think of that question. Why is this happening? I want you to take your Bible to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's a man of whom we are all familiar by the name of the Apostle Paul. And as we look at this portion of Scripture, I begin, I believe we begin to see what God wants to do when we are walking in the midst of trouble. When that affliction, that problem, that hurt, that pain comes into our life. Look at verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Amen. Sir. I submit to you, we... We need to get to the point in our life where we welcome trouble Amen. because through trouble, we can be revived. Amen. God to do something when we're struggling, when we're in the battle, that he doesn't have opportunity to do <coughs> because we don't let him when everything is going great. 
Notice four things with me real quickly. Number one, God sends trouble to deplete us. He sends trouble to deplete us. Now, make sure you got that word. I didn't say defeat us. I said deplete us. He sends trouble into our life, storms, if you will, into our life to empty us, not to crush us, not to hurt us, but to empty something out of our life that shouldn't be there. We say, well, what in the world that could that be? Well, I'm going to just point out two things. On occasion, it is sin. Yep. There's sin in our life, and God has to, he has to kind of put his finger on us to get us to the point where we understand. By the way, with sin in our life, we're not going to be revived. Mm -hmm. With sin in our life, we're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. With sin in our life, we're not going to be a soul winner. With sin in our life, we're not going to be a servant of God. It's not going to happen if we're harboring sin. That's right. right. So what God wants to do is he wants to kind of take us to the woodshed, so to speak, so that we can get that out of our life. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm not going to take you there, but if you're taking notes, write that down. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 11, and we really begin to understand that. God disciplines. He disciplines. As a parent, you discipline. I'm a grandparent, and I discipline you say you shouldn't discipline. Well, let me send the twins to your house. <laughs> You're going to change your tune when you meet them. <laughs> For sure. But you know, it's not just sin that God wants to get out of our life. I'll tell you what else it is. It's self. He wants us to empty us of us. Of self. Now, Paul had this tremendous experience, and we didn't read all the way earlier in the chapter, beginning in verse 1, but Paul had this tremendous experience. He was literally taken up to the third heaven. That's the abode of God. I'm not talking about, you know, the atmosphere, and I'm not talking, you know, about outer space. I'm talking about to the, to the abode of God, the third heaven. So he had this phenomenal experience. Now, that, that's better than a moon landing. I mean, you think about moon landing. I just sent some, you know, some astronauts up the other day to that space center. Um, yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. And this is beyond that. This, is, this isn't the abode of God. Now, I don't know about you, but boy, if, I, if God sent me and only me up there to take a peek, I'd want to tell everybody in the world about it. So would you. We'd be pretty excited about it. So what is Paul's concern? If you look at verse 7, he said, And lest I should be exalted above measure. See, his concern was humility. Two times in this verse, he talks about being exalted above measure. In other words, he knew he had the capacity to be so taken with this, this special uh, experience that he had that no other person had that he would be talking about that experience forever. He said, I don't want that. I don't want that. You know, trials, trouble, have a way to remove pride from our life. Right. Arrogance from our life. Right. Self-sufficiency from our life. By the way, all of those are enemies of revival. But we can't have revival if we're so self-sufficient we don't need God. We can't experience revival if we're so full of pride we don't need Him. If we're so arrogant we think we can handle this thing on our own. How's revival ever going to come to our life or to a church congregation? See, the biggest problem with me is me and the biggest problem with you is you. And sometimes God just has to empty us Amen. of us. Amen. Amen. Someone said this, we've met the enemy, and he is us. Amen. That's true. I asked D.L. Moody one time, the famous evangelist, <laughs> Mr. Moody, who has given you the most trouble in your ministry? Without flinching, he said, D.L. Moody has given me the most trouble in my ministry. <laughs> and I'm telling you, that's my issue and your issue, too, if we're honest. That's why Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Yeah, that's right. Lest that I preach to others, I would be 
disapproved, mm -hmm. a castaway. And I would displease God. So God allows trouble. God sends trouble to deplete us. But there's a second thought. God sends or allows trouble into our life to direct us. This is where it gets interesting. Verse 8. To direct us. Now, verse 8, he said, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. You see, in verse 7, Paul admitted that he had this thorn in the flesh. So, for Paul, this, this thorn in the flesh represented trouble in his life. It was real, it was painful, it was physical. We don't even know really what it was. Some have suggested it had to do with some eye ailment, some physical affliction of some sort. It may have been demonic oppression, not possession, because you cannot be possessed of the devil when you're saved and filled with the Spirit, or indwelt by the Spirit. But regardless of the identity of the thorn, that thorn, that trouble, drove him to God, mm -hmm. directed him to God. You know, the psalmist said it this way, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Amen. Amen. That's, a great, that's a great verse, by the way, Psalm 119 and verse 71. Psalm 119 verse 71, it is good for me that I've been afflicted. Now, how many of us say that? How many just wake up with a flat tire and it's snowing outside and it's 10 below zero and say, oh boy, it's so good that this happened. <laughs> yeah, COVID-19, wow. Isn't that great? No toilet paper at the store, yeah. <laughs> it's good for me that I have no Why? Because it, it directs us back to scripture. Amen. It's right here. Now what does scripture represent? It's the voice of the Lord. Yes. It's, it's God's voice. Amen. He doesn't speak to us in an audible voice. He speaks to us through his word. Amen. Well, people say, well, you know, God spoke to me with an audible voice. No, you had too much pepperoni pizza before bed. <laughs> this is the word of God. Amen. This is God's mind concerning everything we need to know. Amen. It's his word. So this form, this trouble, directed him back to the Lord. And by the way, he, he besought the Lord for, about this thing several times. I mean, he didn't just pray. You know, sometimes we pray, and if God doesn't do something, we walk away. But the Bible says he prayed, he prayed, and he prayed. Maybe beyond that, who knows? A storm, trouble, affliction, has a way to drive us back to the God. Amen. I'll give you the example of it. Jonah. Mm. <laughs> You ever think about Jonah? Yeah. 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 Hold your place here. Let's look at him for a minute. Old Testament. Book of Jonah. It's one of those little books. If you find Amos and Obadiah, then you get to Jonah. You get the mic get too far back up. Jonah. So verse 1, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So that was his mission. That was, that's what God had called them to do. Now, by the way, that's not unusual, because God's called us essentially to do the same thing. God's called us to share his truth with the generation in which we're living. People that we know. So what does Jonah do? Does he... Does he Obey? Well, verse 3, whenever, it's, whenever God gives a command, but then you receive the word but, you know you're in trouble. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So get the picture now. He had the command, but he doesn't go to God, he goes away from God. He went down to Joppa. Whenever we run from God, we go down. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare. By the way, we always pay the fare when we disobey God. And went down into it to go within the Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. So then verse 4, what happens? The Lord sent out this great wind, the sea, I mean, a mighty tempest. I mean, this is really bad because these sailors who did this for uh, their living said, we've got a problem here. We're going down. Somebody 
somebody on this ship is causing this to happen. Because this thing is so massive and so big, God is judging us. And you can read, fill in the blanks, but finally it's jo Jonah's revealed, verse 12. And so Jonah said, take me up and cast me forth. So they do. Chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, well, verse, chapter 1, verse 17, the Lord prepared that great fish. Jonah was swallowed up. And then verse 2, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. See, he had revival. Mm -hmm. Well, what caused that? The trouble. The trouble drove him to God. And then in verse 3, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I give thee. I am so delighted that God is the God of the second chance. Amen. Amen. Because most of the time we mess up the first time. And God has to come back to us and repeat the order. Jonah. The good news is this. When we turn back to God, God is gracious. Amen. He's a God of forgiveness. C.S. Lewis said it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasure. But God shouts to us in our pain. Mm -hmm. And God wants us to do right. That's right. He shouts to us when we're facing trouble and difficulty and affliction. And he's saying, please come back to me. Please get revival in your heart. Please. So God sends trouble to deplete us, empty us of sin or self, to direct us. But also, thirdly, God sends trouble to develop us. Now go back to Corinthians chapter 12 and look with me at verse 9. Well, verse 8 and 9. To develop us. And so verse 8, he says, For this thing, the thorn, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now do you understand the first part of verse 9 is God answering the prayer. You get that? So I, I besought the Lord, and here's what God said. My grace, God's grace, is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. So, what is, what is God saying to him? God is saying to him, you've got to come back to me. Because my grace is sufficient for the trouble that you're experiencing. And you know, in America tonight, if we would just turn back to God, God's grace would be sufficient for what we're facing. Amen. Amen. Well, the song those men sang tonight, you know, how, how powerful. I get back to the word. Yeah. I get back to truth. <laughs> yeah. I get back to what's right. Amen. So then, how does Paul respond? That's the rest of the verse. So Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Mm. So Paul said, okay, I'll take the trouble if I can have God. Amen. I'll take the trouble if I can have his power in my life. Yeah. Here's, here's such an important truth. What God was doing in Paul's life was more important than what God was doing to Paul's life. Mm. See, many times things happen. We say, God, why are you doing this to me? And God is simply saying to you, this trouble is, is not that I'm doing it to you. It's trying, I'm trying to do something in you. Mm. I believe this whole COVID deal I believe God is trying to get us to wake up Amen. as a nation. Amen. I mean, stop and think about this. Right. The greatest nation in the world has been brought to their knees Amen. by a virus that came from who knows where, we believe, president over in China. Amen. Think about that. Amen. So, wow, when are we going to pay attention, God, and turn to you and let you do in us as a nation and as individuals and certainly as believers because judgment must begin first at the house of God. Amen. That's what yeah. revival is all about. Yeah. By the way, Paul longed for the power of the Lord. You, you see that in, in, in his response, most gladly, therefore I'd rather glory in my infirmity. What? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yeah. Hold your place here. Turn quickly to Philippians. Just a few books down the road. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 7. Philippians 3, verse 7. Paul said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss, yep. 
for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. And then verse 9 is our verse in verse 10. He said, not be found in him, and, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is true, the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. Now, Paul was already saved, so he wasn't talking about salvation. He was talking about intimacy. That's right. He was talking about closeness. He was talking about revival. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Amen. Again, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Paul wanted that power in his life. We talked about that last night. Oh my goodness. God wants to develop us. Amen. Lastly, number four. God sends trouble. He allows trouble to deepen us. To deepen us. Now, verse 10. Back to Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. So in light of this, after Paul responds, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then he says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now remember, at the beginning here, he was praying that God would take all that away from him. He, it, when, when we started reading in verse 7 8, he didn't want any of that. that he said, I don't want this storm. And he went before the Lord several times to try to get rid of it. But now he comes to the point where he understands that trouble, that thorn, that storm in his life, that affliction was okay. He said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. Of course, he just lays it out. I take pleasure. When we're weak, it's then that we can become strong in Christ. Amen. 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 <laughs> Only when we understand and acknowledge our weakness can we then appreciate and draw upon his strength. And when you can, wow, what a blessing that is. Reminds me of the old Irish preacher. An Irish preacher up in years. He said, whenever a trial comes into my life, whenever an affliction comes into my life, Whenever a pain comes into my life or a hurt comes into my life, he said, for this, I have Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I thought that's so precious. Whatever it is, whatever that storm is, whatever that trouble is, that's okay. Because for this situation, I have Jesus. Amen. Amen. I have Jesus. Amen. Now, as difficult as it is, we've got to get to the point. Where we take pleasure <coughs> when trouble comes in storms. Now, not because we enjoy the pain. Not because we want to suffer. Not because we have low self-esteem. It's because we understand that in our weakness, our fragility, our inability, that's when God can work. That's when God can move. That's when God can do for us and through us what he's been unable to do because we've been too full of us. Those storms rage, trouble comes, <coughs> not to destroy us, not to defeat us, not to discourage us, not to devour us, not to deny us but to deplete us of sin itself. To direct us back to his word. Amen. To develop our relationship with him. <coughs> and to deepen our dependence on him. Amen. Now think with me. That's really what revival is. Yes. You give me a Christian that is emptied of sin and self. A Christian that is in the word of God. A Christian that is developing day by day their relationship with Christ <coughs> and one who is really dependent on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's what we're by Christian. Amen. That's when Amen. God can do something in and through that person. Yes, sir. 
But here's the tragedy. For most of us, it takes trouble to get us there. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. It takes trouble to get us there. I mean, it's like a child. I, I have two daughters. The first daughter, Amy, honestly, I, I, I have to beat my head on the wall to, to name three things that she did wrong that was so remarkable that I would remember them. She just was, she just kind of popped out and obeyed. Yeah, she's just... But then number two came. <laughs> And if number two had been number one, there would be no number two. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, she, no, no. Are you kidding me? If you said, don't get near this, okay, Daddy. I mean, right there. Don't touch. All right. All right. And that's it. She was constantly doing that. And sometimes, you know, discipline. And then she ended up doing what we were supposed to do. And one day it dawned on her, she's logical, and one day it dawned on her, there's an easier way to get here, just obey to begin with. Because ultimately you're going to get there. Amen. Yeah. I, mean, I guarantee you, she, she was going to get there, or I was going to die trying to get her there. <laughs> and, it, and she figured out, you know, if I just do right to begin with, I can avoid all this pain. God is saying to us, listen, I just want to work in your life in such an incredible way. Yeah. If you'll let me, if you'll walk with me, if you'll love me and serve me and obey me, then we can avoid most of this stuff. Yes. But if not, I'm going to come down on you. And he does. So, tonight, as we look at our life, I, I go back to that verse. I go back to Psalm 138. And I, I just ponder the words in that passage for a moment. Psalm 138, verse 7. And think about it. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Trouble can get us to revival. So I hope tonight that like the Apostle Paul, you'll say, Lord, I, I really... I really want to take pleasure. I want your power. I want that. Would you bow for prayer? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder tonight, as you look at your life, maybe you're going through some trouble right now. We talked about things nationally, but what about you personally? Is your heart breaking over some situation, some burden, some issue that's in your life. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's financial, maybe it's emotional, maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it has to do with your occupation or your family. You're going through the trouble right now, but God wants to use that to get you back to Him in a, in a fresh and sweet and wonderful way. And you say, preacher, pray for me tonight. I, yeah, there's something in my life, and boy, I want, I want to use that. I want that to be used of God to get me back to Him, close to Him. Would you just look that hand? Let me pray for you tonight. I'm not going to embarrass you, but just hold it up. Many hands tonight. Hey, listen, this altar is going to be open in a moment. And I wish you would just kind of set your pride aside and find your way to come down and say, Lord, I want to empty this out. I, I, want, to get, I want to get this out of my life. I want, I want you to do in my life what you want to do. God, I need it. I want revival. Please help me. Would you stand? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'm going to pray, and then they're going to play. And um, no singing. Just They're just going to play. Why don't you find your way to an altar tonight? Come on, dear God, Lord, I pray that we don't go the route Jonah went, where you have to deal with us so harshly, so firmly, to get us to do right. May we embrace as the Apostle Paul, yes, he had the thorn, yes, he didn't want it, but he understood that it was better to live with, with that and have your power and have, have your presence in his life in a fresh and real way. Oh, Lord, I pray that you work in hearts. Hands have been lifted through this building tonight. And God, I pray that you work in hearts tonight. Draw us close to you as never before. Help us to get over whatever it is we're struggling with, to get beyond it for your glory so we can serve you and get engaged and ignited and fired up for Jesus. As he plays, would you come?
this whole mountain. People are here. What about you? Something in your life you need to empty? Attitude, actions, appetites that aren't right? Come on. Trouble can draw us close to God. Trouble can ignite revival in our hearts. Trouble can do for us what pleasure can't. It won't. Would you come? There's time. God, I pray that you would just send you, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit, that he may bring conviction upon our hearts, Lord, and, and uh, turn us to you, Lord. I pray that uh, these problems, difficulties, these situations and crises that we're dealing with in our life in real time, Lord, I pray they would not be a means of destroying us and discouraging us and turning us away from you. But God, may that these things cause us to run to you. And uh, Lord, surrender everything to Christ. And Lord, that our soul, our heart, our, our spirit would be uh, revived again. We'd be excited about the things of God and no matter what's going on in our life, Lord, uh, God is still able. And so, Lord, I pray for your blessing upon us tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, Bob Jones Sr. said this, the crisis doesn't make the man, it reveals him. Amen. And the amazing thing is this, uh, uh, when the crisis has come, uh, God's going to show whether you're running away from him or you're running towards him. That's right. And as God reveals that to us, let's run to the Lord. Amen. Let's not run away from God. Let's, let's right. stay with Jesus Christ. Amen. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. So glad to have you here tonight. Be sure to shake hands with Dr. Shoemaker, talk to him, and uh, encourage him. He certainly has been an encouragement to us. And so praise God. He has been speaking to us in a special way through these meetings. God bless you for being here. Amen.